Thank you everybody for coming over. Um, I am going to present this talk, which is uh, uh, a work that we started around two years ago, uh, and it was uh, at one of the academic conferences this year, uh, which is called uh, NSDI, uh, in Design and Implementation. Our system for, for many reasons is, uh, is called I-10, uh, but uh, if you want to remember something uh, to take away, I think what I'm going to talk about is really um, our attempt to meet uh, the throughput per core of uh, NVMe over RDMA using um, using in kernel uh, techniques uh, without changing any applications or without changing any hardware infrastructure. Um, most of the work was done by my postdoc Shai Huang and Gigi Kai, who's a PhD student uh, here at Cornell University. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of motivation. I think this is uh, almost well known to everybody, but uh, let me give. Uh, a little bit of motivation on why we started thinking about this work. So I think we were motivated by two main hardware trends. Uh, the first one is uh, if you look at uh, uh, typical data center deployment today, um, we have uh, multiple servers, uh, each of which might have certain amount of CPU, certain amount of SSD, certain amount of RAM, um, all connected within a rack uh, using some intra-rack network fabric. And this could uh, probably be a single TAR switch uh, or it could be uh, more complicated in many deployments. So the two emerging trends that we noticed uh, as Jamal was pointing out earlier uh, is uh, that we have these uh, really fast uh, non-vertile memory uh, solid state drives uh, that can now support as many as 1 million IOPS uh, for reads uh, and uh, almost 400K IOPS for writes. Um, and on the other hand, we are also seeing, if you look at the links connecting the servers to the network, uh, we see that there has been a continuous increase of uh, network bandwidth. In fact, uh, uh, a lot of uh, data center providers are already deploying 100 GBPS links. What that really means is uh, we are talking about uh, um, quite a few IOPS going through the network um, uh, or, or the bandwidth uh, uh, being very high means uh, a lot of uh, the hardware can support uh, very high throughput. Um, and since these uh, solid state drives and, and links have gotten much, much uh, faster or high performance, the bottlenecks have, uh, have been pushed back to the software stack. I think this, is, this comes as no surprise to anybody. The second trend, which is perhaps uh, one of the more motivating factors for the work is uh, uh, this trend about uh, resource disaggregation, which is basically a lot of applications are now accessing data over storage devices that are typically disaggregated from compute. And this is happening in many, many forms. And hence, uh, a lot of requests are actually going over the network uh, from the compute side to the storage side. Um, which means that uh, there's an increasing overlap between the storage and network data paths. So once we put these two together, we can start seeing uh, some interesting uh, implications of these trends. Um, and uh, uh, I think these trends are not something that we identified. A lot of people have already been thinking about these problems. Uh, for example, there's been a lot of work in, in the academic world and I think in, in the um, in industry as well on, uh, pushing the entire stack, both the uh, user, uh, sorry, both the storage and the network stack to the uh, user space and saying that, hey, kernel was just not designed for this kind of performance. Um, and they use a variety of techniques uh, to get uh, really, really high performance. So uh, these user space storage and network stacks uh, can get uh, uh, typically uh, sustain very high throughput. Uh, um, and uh, like Jamal was pointing out earlier, uh, usually you have to rewrite your applications or uh, you know, there's there are some uh, modulo, modulo that these stacks are being developed still. Uh, there are still some uh, tricky parts in, in really large scale deployments. The second side is you can take uh, your stack, uh, which is the network side of the stack and push it to hardware. So there's a lot of work on NVMe over RDMA uh, where we keep the storage stack in the network in the kernel and the network stack is pushed out to the hardware. Uh, and the idea is that a lot of uh, network stack related overheads can be avoided. Again, you can get very high performance uh, and uh, almost meet the performance of user space stacks uh, um, using this hardware. Uh, but again, you require some specialized hardware. 
And somewhere in the middle is uh, uh, what uh, um, a lot of work, uh, recent work has been happening over in gaming over TCP, where we keep everything in, in our favorite uh, kernel. And we say that uh, uh, today, at least, we have to give up on performance. Uh, and if you, I'll show you some numbers later on during the talk. Uh, um, today's uh, NVMe over TCP performance can be roughly two to three X worse compared to user space stacks or NVMe over RDMA. Uh, and this is in terms of throughput per core. So, which means throughput per core could be two to three times worse. So you have two ways to look at it, uh, that either I have to give up two to three X more CPU cycles, or uh, I, I'm happy with the lower throughput. And the question really was, is this really fundamental? Uh, do, do we have to really give up this performance for, for staying with the traditional uh, Linux kernel stack? So that's the question that drove us initially. Um, and uh, then we started digging deeper that where are these performance gaps coming from? So let me show you some uh, basic uh, uh, CPU profiling results. So we actually profiled NVMe over TCP and NVMe over RDMA. I'll show you some of the setup later on, but let me tell you what the x-axis is. So there is some application running. Uh, we have the block layer, which I'm dividing into two uh, different aspects, block TX and block RX, which is uh, processing the request and the responses, uh, uh, and network TX and network RX similarly. And then there is some others, which is basically scheduling overheads and everything coming. So if you look at NVMe over TCP, so this is, I'm going to call it storage stack, and the, this is the network stack. If you look at NVMe over TCP, most of the cycles, it should not be surprising, are going into network processing. And if I superimpose network NVMe over RDMA here, then you start seeing interesting trends. NVMe over RDMA essentially does exactly what it is supposed to do. It avoids the cycles that you spend on the network processing, right? And it allows applications and the block layer to uh, use those cycles to get higher throughput. This is essentially what NVMe over RDMA is supposed to be doing. And we can see very clear numbers that this roughly matches the throughput that uh, improvements that you get. Good, so this is nice. Uh, so somehow we have to bridge this gap uh, for uh, existing stack. So there's some network crossing over it. And then there is a, a more implementation level detail that in NVMe over TCP, you are using two threads, uh, um, one at the block layer, one at the TCP IP layer, or the NVMe layer. Uh, and in NVMe over RDMA, you don't have many context switches. So there's some context switching overhead coming uh, in NVMe over TCP, right? So these are the two uh, specific overheads that lead to this performance gap. Good. So uh, what is it that if you want to take away one thing from the stock, here's, uh, here's what uh, would be fantastic to take away. Uh, one is that with very, very uh, simple modifications, it's actually possible to get throughput per core similar to NVMe over RDMA um, using what I'm calling extremely simple mechanisms. Uh, and I hope all of you would agree that uh, uh, what we are doing is really nothing other than batching. Uh, we are just finding the right way to batch uh, things. And that leads to um, uh, NVMe over TCP and extensions, uh, what we are calling ITEM as a uh, cheap throughput per course in the NVMe over RDMA. We, don't, we are not using any specialized functionality from hardware. Uh, and what I'm going to tell you is three very, sim uh, very simple techniques uh, that I'm going to break into item lane uh, caravans. Uh, the first one is simply saying that we should have dedicated resources for individual cores and requests uh, generated at each core. Caravans is one way of batching requests and data packets, uh, response packets. Uh, and then there is the idea of delayed doorbells, which is uh, just interrupt coalescing, right? And I'll, I'll try to give you some insights about how the first two are reducing the network processing overheads. And the last one is uh, trying to reduce the context switching overheads, the two overheads that I talked about on the last slide. So if I showed you just this, it would not be a complete picture. Uh, here I'm only talking about throughput per core. Of course, NVMe or RDMA is much more than, uh, or RDMA in general is more than just throughput. Um, what, do, what is it that is, is still missing? Um, our tail latency which means that once you go through the network uh, or the Linux kernel stack, including uh, NVMe over TCP or ITAN, uh, your tail latency is roughly 117 microseconds higher than NVMe over RDMA. So this is what I'm calling the real overhead. If, if you really want to think about what is the gap between NVMe over TCP and NVMe over RDMA, we should be really thinking about latency as the core overhead, not the throughput per core. And, um, 
one question that one could ask is how how interesting this tail latency overhead is, given that uh, data center deployments typically have hundreds of microseconds of RTTs uh, uh, on an average, anyways. But this is nevertheless an overhead. So this is the slide. If you want to take away anything, this is the slide that you want to take away that we can achieve throughput per core using extremely simple techniques, uh, and there's some tail latency overhead. Good, so let me uh, show you one brief result and then I'll tell you a little bit about these very simple techniques so that we are doing. Uh, and then we will dive deeper into evaluation results. So, uh, because uh, the previous slide might come as a surprise, so let me show you some numbers. So on the x-axis, I'm increasing the load on the system, uh, a single core. Uh, we are basically have two servers attached using 100 GPS links and there is a target side where uh, NVMe SSD is sitting uh, and uh, we are trying to measure tail latency and throughput per core. Perfect. Um, and I'm going to show you four systems. One is NVMe over TCP deployment when we were actually originally evaluating these results uh, for our academic work around a year ago, a year and a half ago. NVMe over TCP has improved that Saji will talk about later in the session. And then I'm going to show you results for NVMe over RDMA and I10. So uh, NVMe over TCP in 2019 uh, peaked out around at 100,000 um, IOPS uh, per, uh, IOPS. Uh, um, for, for our setting. Um, and remember this SSD can actually do roughly 700 IOPS uh, read throughput. The more recent version of NVMe over TCP improves it almost by 50%, which is significant actually. Uh, so they have been doing a lot of exciting work. Um, and NVMe over RDMA um, actually gets roughly 2x higher overhead that I was talking about earlier. Uh, and where is the uh, item sitting in this picture is roughly here which means, uh, like I said, there's slightly higher latency, uh, but you can actually sustain roughly the same throughput uh, or peak throughput uh, as NVMe or RDMA. There's some gap, but I wouldn't think too much into that gap. I don't think that's fundamental. That's just evaluation settings. Uh, but really, the important thing is that we can meet NVMe or RDMA kind of throughput, at least for a single core. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, there's some latency overhead. So one might ask, where is this lower part? Why is NVMe or RDMA still taking 100 microsecond latency? This is really SSD access latency, right? So what if I want to hide this SSD access latency? What I'm going to show you another result, which is uh, I'm going to create a RAM block device so that uh, you know one could ask that, hey, what happens if SSD access latency is improved in future? Uh, so let me show you another result. Uh, exactly everything the same. We just have now the same experiment running on RAM block device. Um, and uh, here's what NVMe over TCP is doing. So slightly throughput improves. Uh, the new NVMe over TCP has slightly improved throughput. Uh, and then NVMe over RDMA. Here you see the real latency benefits of NVMe over RDMA, which is now we are peaking around 20 microsecond latency at the knee point. Um, and this is where NVMe, where I10 is basically. You still give up that 100 microsecond latencies and you meet roughly the throughput of NVMe over RDMA. This is all throughput per core. Good. So the takeaway here is, like I said, throughput per core comparable to NVMe or RDMA can be achieved uh, with uh, roughly uh, 117 microsecond higher tail latency. So now uh, let me spend 10 minutes on telling you uh, quickly how we achieve these results. Uh, and then I'll dive deeper into these results. Perfect. So the first thing is very simple uh, that, hey, somehow we want to avoid uh, sharing resources across different cores, sending out different requests. So what we are going to do is uh, uh, we are going to have uh, let's say there is a single core, uh, applications are submitting their request using a standard IOSS calls. Um, and what we are going to do is, we're going to have block multi-queue is already per core, so that's fine. Uh, I don't have to do anything sh uh, shared across different cores. Uh, I'm going to have a dedicated I10 queue, which is uh, in the most recent NVMe over TCP version. This is basically dedicated uh, um, NVMe over TCP queues. And then I will have dedicated TCP sockets. Uh, on both the host side and on the left, you see the target side. Um, and then this becomes an item lane. Basically, you have created a dedicated channel between, between the host and the target. Um, and you can send the request over these channels uh, and the target will access and SSD and respond everything. So every core basically, at least at the host side, is uh, completely separated out resources and nothing is shared. So that's what we are calling a dedicated um, pipe. And if I had a different target with a, a red NVMe SSD on the right, what will happen here is that uh, we don't want to share resources uh, even across these two SSDs, so even if the requests are coming from the same core. So we are going to create a separate uh, pipe. 
and the request, the only thing that will be shared is block multi queue. Right, so every resource, every other resource is uh, shared, and there's some overhead in terms of memory or storage or memory overhead in terms of keeping some additional data structures, but that's fine. So with that, dedicated resources are settled. Uh, the only thing remaining is what, how do we use these dedicated resources? So I want you to focus on uh, the <clears throat> middle part here. So everything after the block layer, so block multi queue is has. Uh, uh, all the request sitting that is coming from those that core. Uh, the first thing uh, that is happening is uh, if you look at these uh, I 10 queues, uh, you would notice that all the requests sitting in that queue are going to the same destination over the same TCP socket over the same connection, right? So what we can actually do is uh, first thing, very simple thing to do is batch these requests. Uh, and uh, at least for now, we are batching them at 64 kilobyte granularity just to meet uh, um, just to meet some of the other uh, functionalities I'll tell you later, but you can create any size of batches uh, and then you do one socket call per, per batch, right? Very simple technique, nothing fancy happening here. Uh, and the 64 kilobyte was chosen because it allows larger payloads up to 64 kilobyte to, to use TSO. And then uh, the NIC process all its uh, uh, offloads uh, and there are no CPU cycles needed for packet segmentation, right? So we are just using TSO GRO. Good, so that's one simple batching mechanism. Uh, and as I'll show you that it reduces the per byte network crossing overheads uh, uh, at the host side. The, uh, the second one is, uh, I talked about a little bit about the context switching overhead. So let's see a little bit on the host side, what is happening. So in, in uh, traditional NVMe or TCP, what would happen is you receive a request. And as soon as you receive a request, uh, you do what is called, uh, you ring the doorbell. Um, for the NVMe SSD device to know that there's a request now um, and there's a context switch happening because there's a single thread processing these requests. Um, and this request is individually processed by everybody and then you get the response, you're done. The, the problem here is that uh, you have high thread switching overheads uh, and today I think we measured something like one to three microsecond per request, uh, um, which uh, if you do the math for each core, you would just not be able to meet the kind of uh, throughput that we are trying to achieve. So another very simple thing is, uh, which can be combined with the, with the batching idea I talked about earlier, is that you actually coalesce a lot of requests and you ring the doorbell only after certain number of batching, uh, some certain number of requests have been batched. And once you have done that, then you ring the doorbell. Uh, at this point, you are basically doing one context switch for number of requests rather than for each individual request. Good. And then this is uh, processed uh, as, as if it was just a batch. And in case that the system is slowly loaded, then you basically use a timeout period uh, to ensure that the requests are not stored on, uh, on the host side. So these are very two simple optimizations. Uh, uh, that's, that's all I wanted to tell you. And, uh, uh, to show you some of the results, uh, we have the 224 core servers connected directly using a 100 GPS per Knox CX5 NIC. Uh, there are no switches in the middle to ensure that the bottleneck stays in the kernel. Uh, results will only improve if there were switches in the middle. Uh, we have some numbers from NVMe SSDs, uh, and then we are not using any specialized functionalities like NVMe or RDMA or anything. Uh, good. So the questions that I wanted to understand using this evaluation is uh, how does ITIN performance uh, compare to NVMe or RDMA? And here we want to measure throughput per core, average latency, tail latency, et cetera. Uh, we wanted to compare to user space stacks. And then we wanted to understand a whole variety of different workloads uh, and applications. So what happens if we have different read-write ratios? What happens if we have different uh, doorbell timers? Uh, what happens if we do batching at different granularities? What if request sizes are of different uh, granularities? Um, storage devices having different latencies, et cetera. And then scalability, that how does the, uh, the system scale with number of cores? And finally, you know, how does each of this batching mechanism uh, help with the, uh, with the performance numbers? So uh, all these are in the paper. I'll talk mostly about these three that are in bold now. Uh, for everything else, uh, um, basically we have uh, we have quite a few results in the paper, and I encourage you to see the paper. Good. So let's focus on these two. So single core throughput. I already showed you some numbers, uh, uh, and now we can see that uh, where it makes sense. Uh, the gap. 
the latency gap that you see even between NVMe over TCP uh, and I-10 is really coming out of that batching number. So we are spending some extra, uh, some extra time because of uh, waiting for these batches to complete and hence there's some extra latency. Right, uh, but uh, like I said, this is roughly 117 microsecond of uh, tail latency coming because of the batching cycle. Good. Uh, the second thing, which is uh, perhaps uh, uh, also an interesting result, is here I'm going to show you how does the performance uh, scale with number of cores in the system. Uh, so on the x-axis, I'm going to scale the number of cores from one to 24, and I want to understand what is the throughput, overall system throughput, uh, that one can achieve. So for NVMe over TCP uh, in 2019, when we did the original evaluation, this was kind of the scalability. It peaked out roughly at 1,300 um, kilo IOPS uh, uh, with 24 cores. For NVMe over TCP with the recent one, uh, you get some benefits uh, and it still peaks out around 1,500. And NVMe over RDMA, I want to point you until core 14. Um, and until core 14, you see really good scalability. And beyond core 14, there is some issues that we have been talking to Milnox people and trying to understand what's happening with the hardware. It seems to be something related to the hardware, but I wouldn't, again, I don't think that's fundamental. It's, it scales actually pretty well, right? And uh, again, I-10 uh, is able to scale um, almost, uh, well, it's able to scale well, uh, just like NVMe or RDMA does until uh, core 14. But since we are not relying on that hardware, our scalability continues beyond core 14 as well. Right. Uh, again, there's some gap, but uh, you know, uh, I would like to think that that's not fundamental between I10 and NVMe or RDMA. Uh, the important thing is that uh, the curve kind of matches there. Good. So I10 scales similar to current NVMe or RDMA, and uh, uh, that what you're seeing in NVMe or RDMA beyond 14 cores is uh, really uh, some issue related to hardware, but not fundamental. Perfect. Uh, the last thing is, uh, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, you may say, what is happening? Why is it that uh, simple batching mechanisms are helping so much? Uh, um, intuition is very clear that one, one kind of batching that I talked about reduces the network processing overheads and the other kind of batching reduces the context switching overheads. Um, but how much is it really helping? So the, on this plot, what I'm showing you is on the x-axis, we have different number of cores. Uh, so each core is generating a request to the target server. And then um, the blue one at the bottom is basically, think about it as NVMe over TCP. Uh, the red one is showing what is the contribution because of using TSOGRO and jumbo frames uh, or larger um, uh, packet sizes. Oh, maybe I didn't mention this earlier. I should have mentioned that we are also using jumbo frames. Uh, um, and uh, uh, and that's one thing. Uh, the next green one is the benefits that we get out of doing batching of uh, requests and responses. And the last one is batching of uh, uh, requests before we ring the doorbell and hence uh, interrupt coalescing, right? Uh, the important and interesting thing to think about here is that really people talk about jumbo frames quite a bit, that, uh, but it's really just helping 14% in terms of throughput. Right? So it's not significant benefits, but if we look at these two very simple batching mechanisms, they almost lead to 62% uh, improvements in throughput right? uh, on the baseline. 62% uh, uh, and that's where most of our benefits are coming from. So uh, the important thing I want to point out is that we have not yet found, we have done extensive experiments, but if we take away any of these components, we are not able to saturate 100 GPS links. But when we put all of these components together, we are able to saturate 100 GPS links. So it seems like uh, at least in the current implementation, each design component is important for the final performance. And very, very simple batching mechanisms lead to 62% of the improvement with some latency overheads. Good. So. Uh, Everything that I talked about, as I also copy pasted in the chat window, everything uh, is on our GitHub repo. Uh, we have had uh, at least four or five um, institutions that have reproduced our results, uh, but uh, everything that you need to reproduce our results is, is in the repo. We are working with the Linux community to push it upstream. Uh, and uh, I think I would be happy to take questions at this point. Jamal, you're muted again. 
Yeah, sorry about that. Um, do you want me to read the questions, Rashid, or you want to respond yourself? Uh, Jamal, can I stop sharing? Because I can't see some yes. don't allow me to. Uh, yeah, yes, you can stop sharing. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I think I'll just repeat the question for the sake of time. I will, there's not as many questions. So no more questions, please. Uh, come, come to the happy hour. You'll be there at the happy hour slash whiskey slash yerba mate hour. I will Rashid. bring my whiskey along. Yes. Okay, good. All right. So uh, first question is from uh, Shrijit. He says, I think, I hope I didn't miss anybody, but it's interesting that the network transmit overhead is higher than receive. Any insights? Uh, why? Is is it the resegmentation? So Shridit uh, is uh, awesome enough to answer his own question. I agree. It's, it's actually just oh, resegmentation. It actually does Boris. Yeah, yeah. So all the questions that are current here, I think, have been answered. The one or has a question that I think is maybe worth a okay. bit of Or do you want to go or you want me to repeat what he said? Yes, I just commented that for those storage workloads uh, in modern stack of TSO LRO, um, I think you can get the same results also with job jumper frames. And uh, I gave you this comment a couple of months ago. And um, for instance, in the SPDK framework, so uh, um, their performance team, they stopped using Jumbo and they, and they got the same results even better. So... Perfect, yes, or like we talked or in the past, uh, Jumbo frames are really not helping all that much. So uh, we should we should rerun more results. Uh, yes, uh, that, have... uh, uh, sorry for nudging on this on this piece, but you know, uh, I, I believe that most modern data centers do not use Jumbo frames. In, in Google, they do use it, but it's a special case and they did lots of work in their infrastructure to enable Jumbo frames. So, if you want to provide something which is more general, you, you don't want to assume that the deployment has Jumbo. Perfect. Uh, yes, like I showed in the results that, uh, you know, Jumbo frames uh, actually just give us a very small improvements. And, uh, um, and uh, you know, if people are not using Jumbo frames, I think that would be just fine. Uh, but it is interesting that uh, we should we should probably uh, run some more results with uh, without Jumbo frames as well. Okay, let, let's move back to the happy hour. Uh, question from Asiak. How many cores do you need to saturate the 100 gigabits with all your improvements? Uh, perfect. So uh, this is uh, Masiak. Uh, Masiak, uh, uh, let me pull up the exact number. Uh, if you just give me one second, I think we needed uh, 22 cores um, to saturate the 100 GPS link. Uh, uh, which was, I think, around uh, 2.1, sorry, 3.1 million IOPS. And last question is from David Niemi. Uh, have you looked at which features affect latency adversely and by how much? Yes, uh, perfect. Uh, David, uh, I think the latency is just coming out of the batching part. Uh, it's, uh, it's just... Uh, uh, in, in the tail case, what happens is uh, because of the bursty nature, if applications submit requests uh, um, you know, in a bursty form, sometimes it happens that we are waiting for 50 microseconds of timeout period that I talked about in batching uh, to send out the pool. Uh, and when the timeout happens, you give up 100 microseconds. And I think with some slight uh, overheads or here or there, it becomes 117 microseconds. So that's where the latency overheads are coming from. Does that make sense? Uh, Jamal, I would add one more question to skip, which is Lawrence's question. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Lawrence Brackmore, uh, please prefix with Q. It's my eyes scan for the Q for all the questions. Um, do you know what flavor of TCP that you use? And uh, could you could a change in this flavor of TCP affect the tail latency? Ah, that's a good question. Um... I don't know at the top of my head. Jaihu, my postdoc is here. Do you know, Jaihu, what flavor of TCP were we using? Um, I, I can answer the second part of the question, but uh, um, I don't remember exactly at the top of my head which TCP were we using. Uh, okay, we were using Cubic. So, uh, Lawrence, in, in a general deployment, you're absolutely right that uh, the 
different TCP flavors could have different tail latency. Our setup was so easy because we just connected two servers directly because we were trying to avoid the network uh, latencies to make our results look good because if, the net, if there is higher network latency, then our results will actually look nicer. Um, so uh, there was no congestion in the network and hence uh, these results uh, would not be affected by tail latency that much. Um, we are hoping to run larger experiments. We are kind of limited in terms of, uh, you know, we academics and, and uh, we don't have a large test spread to run these experiments, but uh, we are hoping that uh, once we, once the upstream code is out and uh, we have uh, some, uh, some, and we have been working with the Lightbits people and, uh, and uh, Saji to see if we can actually do more and more evaluation. I think that would be fantastic. Thank you, Rashid. So, um... If people are interested, we can also create a breakout room for storage of the networking. Uh, just comment on the chat. Thank, thank you, Rashid.